Hi, I'm Chris and welcome to the first part of my two year review of our solar power journey. This time I'm taking an in-depth look at our first two years experience with solar power, having had our system installed in late July 2022. In this, the first of a three-part series, I'm going to walk through our system setup in detail, covering both hardware and software, and highlighting any issues we've experienced and some of the lessons learned. Hopefully this might prove useful to you if you're thinking about getting solar installed, or maybe it's just of passing interest. In the second part, I'll dive into the figures in detail, looking at how much power we've generated and how well it compares with what we might have expected. I'll also look at the economics, including installation cost, energy tariffs, export figures, cost savings, and ultimately payback expectations. In the third part, fingers crossed, we'll look at a DIY upgrade I'm carrying out to our solar panel capacity, which I'm just about to make a start on. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss parts two and three. If you've already subscribed, thanks. And if you enjoy this video or find it useful, please do hit the like button. With all that said, let's get started. Beginning at the sharp end, we have two banks of six Jinko Solar 375 watt panels installed on broadly east and west facing roof pitches, giving us a total installed panel capacity of 4.5 kilowatt peak. Our roof slope of 41 degrees is just at the upper end of the typical UK roof slope range of 30 to 40 degrees. The panels face around 100 degrees east and are pretty much unobstructed, meaning that we get excellent solar coverage with no shading. The west bank is a similar setup, in this case facing 280 degrees west. We do get a small amount of shading very late in the day from the chimney stack, but by that time the sun is very low in the sky, so it's not too much of an issue. A couple of the trees are probably just getting to the height again where they need a quick trim to avoid them casting any shade, but even without that it's pretty minimal. Although I'll talk more about lessons learned in the second part of this video, one of the key things I wish we'd done is install more panels at the start. We'd got quotes from three different suppliers, all of them offering different solutions, with panel capacities of 4, 4.5 and 5.6 kilowatt peak. I go into this in a bit more detail in an earlier video. At the time, I couldn't see how the supplier pushing the larger 5.6 kilowatt peak system could fit the panels in the space they were proposing, and so was happy to go with our preferred supplier, even though this meant the slightly smaller array we ended up with. Looking at it today, and excluding putting panels on the north side of the house, there are realistically only two options. One would have been to see if we could squeeze in some panels in portrait mode up the side of the existing array. Nipping up onto the garage roof recently and taking some rough measurements, it does look like we could have got up to three panels vertically in the available space. We wouldn't necessarily have put the maximum of three on each side though, as that would have been a major increase in capacity and cost. The biggest issue with this, however, is that it would have only left a gap of around 350 to 400 millimetres between the edge of the additional panels and the face of the dormer, making maintenance access very difficult. So I wasn't keen on that. The other option would have been to put some panels on the roof of the dormer itself, but this would have meant scaffolding being needed on this side of the house. In contrast to the quote, which envisaged working on the east bank just with access from the flat garage roof. With the benefit of hindsight, I think we should have explored both of these options further with our chosen supplier. While we're up here, it's worth a quick look at the panels close up. The first thing to say is that, at least in my opinion, the DC cables running from panel to panel should probably have been secured much better. Certainly a few closer space zip ties wouldn't have gone amiss. I suspect this is down to the fact that the guys who installed the panels were primarily roofers, whereas installation of the inverter, batteries etc in the garage was done by an electrician, whose work was generally very good, with one exception I'll highlight shortly. This might be something to consider when you're having a system installed, as most people are not going to be able to get a close-up view of what's been done on their roof. The second thing is that, although we've had the odd splat of bird crap here and there, the panels have been pretty much self-cleaning, probably down to the amount of rain we've had this year, and also the steepish roof slope. 
Whilst there's clearly some dirt here and there, I'm not planning to clean them anytime soon, as I don't believe it's affecting their efficiency that much. I'd be interested though to hear if you've got any views on how you judge when your panels might need cleaning and what's the best method. Whilst we're here, the other thing I wish we'd considered is perhaps having some bird spikes or netting installed to prevent nesting under the panels. It wasn't that we chose not to do it, it was more a case that the supplier didn't propose it and you don't know what you don't know. Although, touch wood, we haven't yet had any problems. We do have wood pigeons visiting the garden regularly, so it could just be a matter of time. For the moment though, they seem to prefer nesting in the beech hedge, so long may that continue. Okay, enough of the panels, let's look at the business end. At the heart of the system is a Solis 3.6 kilowatt hybrid inverter that was initially paired with two Pilantec US 3000C 3.5 kilowatt batteries, giving an installed storage capacity of 7 kilowatt hours. I'll go into the reasons why we chose the supplier that we did in an earlier video, and to some extent that dictated the choice of hardware, but for us, the combination of Solis hybrid inverter and Pilantec modular batteries was a compelling offer. We like the large LCD display and controls on the inverter, which allow you to easily view or change pretty much any data you need to. Here was something that enabled us to nip into the garage, press some buttons and quickly see what's happening. If the remote monitoring software ended up not being as good or reliable as promised, we could just go and have a quick look at the inverter itself. And just on that, I am so glad that we were not bounced into having the inverter and batteries installed in the loft. From both a fire risk and accessibility viewpoint, this never made sense to me. Although it is still permitted, as long as certain considerations are met, the best practice guide PAS 63100, issued by the BSI in March this year, outlines that solar batteries should not be installed in voids, roof spaces or lofts. It's going to be interesting to see how all this pans out in terms of updated regulations. I still really do like the Pilantec US series of modular batteries, they work well with the Solis inverters and they lend themselves readily to expanding your storage capacity over time, when your budget allows. For example, a 4.8 kilowatt hour US 5000 module can be had for around £1200 including VAT. Installation is straightforward and I would say within the capabilities of most people with a reasonably technical mindset. I added a US 5000 module in October 2023 bringing our total storage capacity to 11.8 kilowatt hours. There's an argument to be made for just going for the largest possible battery storage capacity you can afford from day one. But my experience has been that suppliers mark up battery storage by a large percentage margin, and there are clear savings to be had if you can purchase and install yourself. Turning to the variety of smaller items and how it's all strung together, we can see the cables from the solar panels are brought down into the garage and routed to a pair of DC isolators mounted on the wall panel, from which they are taken onwards to the input connectors on the underside of the inverter. As far as I understand it, this is no longer recommended practice due to concerns over fire risks in the DC isolators. How significant or not that is, I can't say. However, the latest code of practice RC62 from the Fire Protection Association recommends the use of DC isolators be eliminated wherever possible, as many inverters now have integrated isolators, as does the Solis that we have. Sticking with DC, we have the three Pilantec battery modules connected in parallel with the newest US 5000 module at the top of the CAN communication chain to the inverter. The DC cables from the batteries are routed to a manual isolator, or more correctly, a Jean Muller fuse switch disconnector, which is hard to say, which has two 80 amp fuses fitted, one in the positive connection and one in the negative. They're then routed up to the relevant connectors on the underside of the inverter. While we're talking batteries, although I'd thought I'd prepared pretty well for the installation, having cleared some space in the garage for all this kit, I hadn't really given much thought to battery storage. So when the electrician was just planning to put them straight onto the garage floor, the best I could do at the time was rustle up a piece of plywood for them to stand on. To make space for the US 5000, I ended up replacing this with a simple platform made from a surplus piece of kitchen worktop and a couple of lengths of 2 before fastened along the underside to spread the load and keep everything off the floor. There's just enough space to accommodate a second US 5000 if we chose to add more storage capacity in the future. 
It was after I'd published a video about installing the US 5000 that a viewer noticed that there was no earth cable linking the inverter to the batteries. It turned out this had been the case from day one. The two US 3000C modules had been connected together with an earth cable, but it then didn't connect to anything else. Amazingly, I'd not spotted this despite looking at these batteries any number of times, and even after connecting up the US 5000 module to the initial two with another earth cable. Thanks, David Lloyd 2316. Thankfully, it wasn't too difficult to sort out, but it shows that installation errors can and do occur. The funniest thing about all this is, our installation was visited by both the supplier's QC manager and the regional MCS representative. And whilst I got a full complement of lovely QC pass stickers, nobody, including me, spotted that mistake. Whilst I'm talking about issues, one small niggle relates to the Solis Wi-Fi dongle come data logging stick. It's not that we've had any problems with the dongle itself, it's just the process to be followed if ever the network connection has dropped. It's only happened two or three times in two years, but occasionally the dongle has lost connection to the house Wi-Fi, and it doesn't always reconnect automatically. In those situations, you need to unplug the dongle from the bottom of the inverter and plug it back in again, effectively powering it down and back up. It has to be unscrewed and rescrewed to do this, which, when you're doing it working upside down, can prove to be a bit of a faff. It's not a major issue by any means, more just an annoyance. OK then, it's pretty much just the AC side that's left, which is comprised of a small dedicated consumer unit, an AC isolator and the export meter. The labelling of each of the items in the consumer unit isn't that helpful in my view, but I'm guessing it's configured along the lines of this schematic in the operation manual for the Solis inverter. The main functional item is the Acrel ACR-10R single phaser energy meter, which is connected to the CT clamp and communicates via RS-485 with the inverter. It's worth highlighting that we don't currently have any connection to the inverter's AC backup output, so wouldn't have any emergency supply in the case of a grid outage. The main consumer unit for the house is on the other side of this wall, in the front porch, which is where the AC connections for the solar consumer unit and the larger one up the wall are taken to and connected in via Henley block type connections. The final thing to note is the CT clamp on the house side line connection to the smart meter. And in terms of hardware, that's it, at least for now, pending the panel upgrade. Now, apologies if I've bored you to death with all that info, but I quite often see comments on other videos where people are asking about the detail of an installation. So hopefully, it might prove of some interest to some of you. Regarding choice of equipment more generally, a question some people have asked me when we've got talking about solar power is whether it's better to wait for a while, perhaps until the next new thing comes out, whether that be a new model of inverter or a new range of batteries, etc. In my mind, it's a bit like buying a camera used to be or buying a phone is today. Whatever you invest in, it's probably going to be superseded by a newer model with more bells and whistles in a few months or a year's time. My answer to these people then is to look at what's available on the market at the time, determine which is right for you, and then just take the plunge. For sure, there are newer, flashier systems available today than there were when we were looking around, but with this sort of purchase, I'd argue long-term support and spurs availability are as, if not more, important. Ultimately, if you go with a modular system and experience a major issue, it should be possible to swap out the inverter or batteries without needing to pretty much rip out or change everything. But that's just my view. At this point, I was going to dive into the Solis Cloud web platform and mobile app, but given this video is already starting to get quite long, I think it might be better to leave that for another time. Just to say that I was quite critical about the functionality and stability of the Solis Cloud platform in this video I posted last year. However, I'm big enough to admit I've completely changed my view now following various updates they've made, and it now does pretty much all I need from it. Two major shortcomings that I griped about were the lack of a graph view of the state of charge and the fact that there was no inverter remote control capability, meaning you had to use the front panel to set up any time-specific forced battery charging and discharging. These are both now supported by both the web and mobile app, 
and work pretty well as far as I can tell. Whilst we can all have a view on UI design and colour choice, it's not something I'll lose any sleep over anymore. Now there's quite a bit of Solace Cloud content already available on YouTube, so there probably isn't much I could add. But if anyone has any specific questions or viewpoints, do post a comment. In addition to the issue with the battery earthing and the small niggle regarding the design of the Wi-Fi dongle, the only other issue we've experienced is an irregular but persistent occurrence of inverter alarm code 2015. Whilst I've mentioned this in a couple of my earlier videos, it's worth a brief update given it's still occurring after two years. The symptoms when this occurs are that the inverter goes offline for about one minute and then recovers automatically and seemingly operates as normal afterwards. The first few times this happened, just a few weeks after the system was installed, we happened to be on holiday in Europe, so obviously you start thinking the worst. But each and every time it's occurred, the system has always recovered automatically. My understanding is that this is a BMS battery management system related alarm, and having looked at the timing of the alarm messages, they seem to coincide with the batteries reaching their fully charged state of 100%. However, the batteries regularly get charged to 100% without this alarm being triggered, so there's not a direct cause and effect relationship. After a while, I eventually got round to logging a call ticket with Solis support, and fair dues to them, within a few hours, they'd replied with a request to remotely troubleshoot and make any necessary settings changes. And then, within the next 24 hours, I got a firmware upgrading and settings done message from them. To be honest, I was more than a bit disappointed because my support call was very much geared around asking if they could explain what they thought the issue might be, rather than just jumping in and changing things. Of course, I hadn't had the presence of mind to note down all the settings and firmware version beforehand, so I have no idea what was changed. But in any case, it didn't resolve the problem, with a couple more instances in the following week or two. I did a bit of trolling around on various forums, but without a huge amount of success to be honest. My suspicion is that the alarm is triggered when there's a difference in the battery voltage as reported by the Pylantec BMS and the voltage as monitored by the inverter itself. Looking at the graphs pulled from the inverter, we're only talking about a very small difference, so maybe the alarm threshold is too narrow, or maybe it's just something else completely. And of course, with the passage of time and the fact that it's not causing any real problem, you end up just ignoring it. Although I appreciate it's getting down into the weeds somewhat, having plotted out the occurrences over time, I've noticed that most of the peaks tend to occur whilst we've been away from home on holiday. Murphy's Law at work, obviously. Now, the frequency does seem to have increased during 2024. And is that a sign of an impending issue? Are we just taking more holidays? Who knows? Obviously, if anyone has any knowledge of this or thoughts on the alarm issue, please do post a comment. Well, if you've made it this far, thanks so much for sticking with it. I hope you found it of some interest. In the next part, I'll dive into the figures from how much power we've generated right through to our latest payback expectations. So make sure you are subscribed. Thanks for watching, I really do appreciate it, and see you on the next one. Cheers!